How's it going, everybody? My name is Antonio, and I'm here today on October 5 with Chris Frostat, President and CEO of PurePoint Uranium, which is, as the name suggests, a uranium exploration company with assets on the eastern, the western, and the southern part of the Athabasca Basin in um, in Saskatchewan in Canada. Who's not here with us today, though, is your financial advisor. This conversation is not going to include any recommendations to do absolutely anything. You're not going to be uh, told to buy nor sell anything. It's just going to be a talk, a casual talk between two people who you have likely never met. So you don't have any reasons to trust anybody blindly uh, because this is going to be a conversation that's general and impersonal in nature, as well as a conversation that is um, that should not be used as independent research because it is going to include a lot of forward-looking statements about uncertain events that may or may not happen in the future. So what I would suggest, although I just told you not to trust anybody on the internet, I would suggest you take the minute to pause the video and read the full warning that is on your screen right now because the mineral exploration, development, and mining industries are among the highest risk industries out there. Uh, so if you care about money and you don't like losing it, uh, again, do more research by visiting the company's website and analyzing its official filings on setter.com, as well as consult a professional investment advisor before making your own decisions in the end. That all said, PurePoint is a $19 million market cap company. It is divided um, across uh, about 417 million shares outstanding, and that makes this a four and a half cent stock. There are 138 million warrants with a weighted average strike of 13 cents, and there's uh, 32 and a half million options at nine cents average strike, which means that there are about 590 million fully diluted shares. Stock trades on the TSX Ventures Exchange under the ticker symbol PTU, where an average of about a million shares trade a day with a 52-week high of $0.09 cents and a 52-week low of $0.03. Cents. At the end of uh, June this year, the company had $1.2 million in cash. There was $275,000 in deposits. Uh, some prepaid expenses as well as some accounts receivables bring their current assets at the end of this year's first half to about $1.6 million. That's against uh, current liabilities of... Um, almost nothing we can almost call nothing is about sixty thousand dollars stemming from a, a lease uh, and also some accounts payables PurePoint currently has uh interest in 13 projects um in and around the athabasca basin 10 of those projects are 100 percent owned while two other projects are under joint venture agreements one of them is with cameco alone and another one is with uh, cameco and orano combined Hook Lake is the name of the project that is under the trio where uh, Cameco owns almost 40% of it, Orana owns another almost 40%, and then PurePoint owns 21% of the project. But as the operator of the project, PurePoint also earns a management fee that is paid by the, the joint venture partners in this case, and that is a 10% uh, management fee. Hook Lake is on the western side of the basin, deeper into the basin actually than NextGen's arrow. You can sort of think about it when, when you look at Fission's triple R deposit and you go to the mm. north, uh, you would have uh, Next Gen's Arrow, and then you go a little bit more to the north, and then you would have Hook Lake. Land package here is not huge, but it's definitely not small for the basin either. It's at 28,500 um, hectares, and uh, that includes the Spitfire discovery that PurePoint made there uh, a while back. And that discovery, interestingly enough, lies on the Patterson Structural Corridor, which this is the same corridor, basically, that hosts uh, Next Gen's Aero and Fission's Triple R deposits. That that's why I mentioned them. Fission, by the way, recently wrote a blog post about what's going on in the Western Athabasca Basin right now and its uh, potential emergence as Canada's next source of uranium over the next uh, couple of decades. So that that's interesting to read if you're interested in that side of the basin. And um, but then there's also. Well, back to your point, of course, there's also the Smart Lake project here. Again, also a joint venture. This one is uh, only with Cameco. So PurePoint owns 27% of this project. Cameco's got the other 73%. This project is about 20 kilometers away from Hook Lake, the, the previous project that I was telling you about. And it is uh, 60 kilometers south <laughs> of the historic Clough Lake mine. There's a lot of lakes in Canada, if you hadn't figured it out. Uh, but so Clough Lake was operated by uh, Orano, I believe it used to operate it. And then uh, this, this so the Smart Lake project is about 55 k's from uh, She Creek, uh, so it is on the southwestern part of the basin. It is um, um, a smaller land package than the previous one. It's a, a little under 10,000 hectares, but geophysical studies show that it might be geologically connected to uh, to to, um, to She Creek, and uh, because it's on the it's on, it's on what what is called the Saskatoon Lake Conductor. So this is. Um, 
for the people who have a life. This is a geophysical anomaly. It's specifically an electromagnetic anomaly. And it's, it, again, geologically important and similar to uh, Shea Creek. Uh, the project hasn't been drilled in 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 uh, what over ten years now, I believe. Uh, but there seems to be hope for next year's drill season. Um, but again, I'm not going to annoy you too much uh, with my beautiful voice here. So I'll just tell you more about one more project, and then I'll then we'll hear from Chris on this on Smart Lake. But again, go go and check out their presentation if you want to see all the projects. They're beautifully laid out in the presentation. But then there's uh, Red Willow. Red Willow is um, one of Pure Point's largest land packages. I believe it's the second largest land package in their portfolio. It's 40,000 hectares, so that's 400 square kilometers. It is 100% owned, and it is um, uh, currently being drilled. I believe this is the project that they, they were the most active on uh, recently. This one is on the eastern side of, of the basin, so all the other way around. Um, slightly to the north side of the East Basin. So it's not too far away from Cameco's Cigar Lake mine. Uh, it's not right next to it, but it's sort of in, in the same neighborhood, just so you know where it is. Again, there's 10 more projects, but I don't have the brain capacity to go through all of them. So I'll hopefully be hearing more about these projects later on. But for that to happen, I'm going to have to shut up already and uh, welcome the CEO. So Chris, thank you for investing your time in me, sir. Well, thank you, Antonio. Boy, we, we all learned a little there. <laughs> What did I, uh, something that I messed up? Oh, no, 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 no. No, it's, you know, it, it's, it's somewhat fluid in terms of, of, uh, of how we're operating and things slightly change. Um, but, uh, but by and large, I think you painted the picture that we're, we're operating under at the current time. This is not the first time you know I are, are speaking, but it is the first time that you're in the hot seat of the new channel. So uh, why don't you why don't you give me sort of a, a better overview? But instead of only talking about the <clears> positives, <throat> maybe you can talk to me about three things that. Well, sure, give me three things that you do like. But also, let's maybe talk about three things that you not so much like, and you would change if you could do so by waving a magic wand. Well, obviously, the markets have been the the one the one big issue. It's been interesting over the last three years. I think three years ago. You know, we were, we all saw uranium taking off again, and we saw a few few issues or a few uh, events out there that that bumped up the spot price, be it Sprott or Cameco or whomever, and uh, it kind of peaked about 16, 16 months ago, I guess, and uh, and then dropped right off again. So um, I think what what uh, what's been happening over the last 15, 16 months is we've seen the spot price of uranium now slowly coming back, and it's been you know on a, on an upward trend since then which is good for us all because it, it's it's more stable it's more dependable it, it looks like it's coming back based on uh you know real market fundamentals and we all know how opaque the price of uranium is but but what we've certainly seen is that all of the equities have, have now drifted back down so i mean it's been uh <clears throat> you know it's been a challenge over the last year year and a half um, you know, to really know how to how to move, make your next move, because we we have seen this all the gains that were made in two thousand and one sort of fall off in two thousand and three, and and that's that's made it a little more difficult for us to kind of time the market and figure out what we want to do from 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 one point to another. Uh, um, you know, it makes it difficult, uh, you know, to make sure that your your properties are maintained, that you're getting ready for a next cycle to come back, and uh, and you've got the people to do so. So it, it's you know as always it's it's kind of that ebbing and flowing and how do you how do you ride this roller coaster or keep it as smooth a ride as possible, um, you know without making any jarring moves. That's certainly been uh, um, you know something I'd love to have waved a magic wand over over the last little while. Mm. And uh, you know and then of course right now as we do see this the price of uranium really starting to to jump in a more frenetic manner. Um, you know, the, the rest of the markets aren't, aren't, uh, cooperating. So we're, we're kind of, uh, getting buck hit with another bucket of water right now. And although I think uraniums are probably doing better than most, um, you know, it's, it's certainly not helpful as we're trying to come into, you know, a real positive time and, uh, and the markets in general on, on a higher level really aren't, aren't cooperating. Um, you know, but other than that, it's been, uh, you know the other things we'd like to change. We'd always like to see our partners throwing more money than they do at uh, at Hook Lake and Smart Lake. Although they've been, you know, they've con continued to and and will continue to. Um, but as I've always said before, they kind of pace us. They don't approach it in the, in the same manner as as we might. Um, you know, as I say, they've got about a five to ten year window that they plan within, and we've got about a five to ten week window that we plan within so it's 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 always a, a bit of a negotiation there in between um 
what else can I tell you? I think, you know, I think right now, given, <clears throat> you know, given, given what we've, uh, you know, uh, sort of managed through over the last 10, 15 years, it's hard to complain about anything that's going on right now uh, in the markets. And I think we've, we've spent a lot of time making sure that we're prepared for it um, it's because we've, we've seen this market jump all over the place many times. And uh, it, it really is, you know, trying to prepare for something that may or may not show up. So the timing of this market's always been a, a challenge as well. Hmm. But I was thinking more about stuff like, you know, company specific, for example, tell you something that hits me right in the face when I open up sure. uh, your website would be the uh, the share structure is the first thing that I that I noticed. Oh, absolutely. Was- and I should have mentioned that out of the gate, but but you're you're absolutely right. So we've, uh, I mean, you, you're fully diluted a little bit off because we've a lot of those warrants have fallen off over the last uh, few months. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, you know, for us, when we do another financing, we're, we're you know, we're, we're creeping up to, you know, 450 or plus million shares outstanding, which which the Canadian exchanges aren't aren't typically used to. If you're in Australia, that's fine. But uh, up here, it, it, it doesn't work. And, and, you know, our challenge all along has been, you know, if we do do a consolidation and we do have, you know, we do at our AGMs always include a vote uh, to do a rollback and a consolidation. Uh, should it should it make sense at some point in time? But the challenge is, you know, we've seen it. We've seen a number of companies do this. Um, even in the last few years, we saw Asencore do it. We saw Encore do it. And and over the years, we've all seen the same thing. You do a rollback, your share price goes up to whatever, and it immediately starts drifting back down to where it was. And uh, and so it's never made anybody happy to see any companies doing these consolidations. Um, so our, um, you know, our market cap, our share price, our volumes have all been pretty consistent over time. And uh, until we see it being a problem, which it isn't yet, um, you know, we're, we're, we don't, we're, we're, we're loathe to, to start rolling back shares and seeing the value drop off for everybody. Having said that, if, um, you know, if we were in the position of, if there was an event, uh, a re-rating of some sort based on a discovery, based on a transaction. If we do a large transaction, we're always talking to people. Um, we would definitely take that opportunity to, um, you know, to tighten up, tighten up our capital structure. Absolutely. But, you know, until that comes along, I don't think it's of value to shareholders at all. Never, It's never shown to be to, uh, to try and do that now. What would it take for you to do that more specifically? Because is, <clears throat> is it just a discovery or is it something else? Uh, no, no. I mean, there's a lot of M and A going on out there right now. I mean, if if we were for some reason to to acquire or be acquired, if we were you know, for some reason to uh, pick up another significant project from one of our partners, um, you know, anything anything that that um, elevates or re rates um, potentially the co- the company. Would be would be a reasonable time to do that sort of consolidation because you're you're you know it's being done based on based on a a positive event as opposed to you know desperation that I need to get my share price back up to a dollar <clears throat> from a dime you know I mean that's if that's if that's the only reason of doing it and that's what we've seen people doing it's it it never you can show me if I'm wrong but <laughs> it's it's never really worked out for shareholders. No, right. It's, it's absolutely. I mean, roll banks only work if, if there's any significant event to go with that. Um, it, do you think that might be the reason or, or is it market specific why your stock has been sort of lagging? The Like if we look at the ETFs, mm-hmm. it, they're performing better than, than and you're not alone. There's a couple of other juniors that I've interviewed yeah. as well that are also yeah. lagging. But it does it have to do with the market or is it share count and other stuff that are holding it back? Well, you say holding back, but I mean, if if you look at the change in share price of, of all of the junior exploration companies, and I can show you the graph if you want to see it someday, because we stare at it all the time, what you would see is that we are we we are at or above the average in terms of changing you know share price movement. We you know everybody everybody goes. I mean, we get complaints from people that may have bought high. I mean, let's face it, we were up to fifteen cents or sixteen cents you know a year and a half two years ago. Now we're down to a nickel or six cents or what, whatever we're at today. So, so you know, people, if we go up a half a cent or up, you know, whatever people, people aren't, aren't, you know, they're, it depends on what context they're looking at it in. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's been a couple of companies that took a run for some reason, but they've come back off. Uh, so we, we tend to be a lot less volatile 
um, for sure than than uh, the other juniors. And I, I think a lot of that has to do with our relationship with with the majors and and you know the fact we've been around for so long. But we we are far less volatile, and we to a bump. Uh, flow with and just slightly above the average uh, in terms of, of price changes with with, with share price. Um, I, the, as far as ETFs go, now the ETFs are, uh, can't pick up uh, positions in companies that have less than a uh, $50 million market cap, right? So, um, you know, so that's that holds back any of us that are, you know, sitting with 20 or $25 million. So, you know, that may be another, you know, the impetus for us to to uh, join forces with with another company would would be to put us in that range where we can start getting picked up by ETFs or where there is a re-rating um, and it allows us to consolidate shares or whatnot. But I mean the the sheer number of shares in and of itself I don't think is 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 the factor or a factor in in uh, you know where we sit. But frankly. It, well, it's always a tricky balance, I suppose, as well, of how how active are you and how 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 much news are you putting out there? Because if there's nobody to listen to your <clears throat> news, is it yep. really worth putting shareholders' money into news making activities so that you can just put something out there, but there's nobody listening to it, so there's nothing to share price. But at the same time, if you don't do that, then you start mm -hmm. lagging. That's why that, that's one of my theses as, as to why I think juniors oftentimes will lag. You know your developers or the majors who, who might have more activity and more news in times where juniors sure. are just preserve, preserving capital. That's one thing. Well, ma majors have less news probably uh, most of the time than the juniors. We're always scrambling for news. I guess you know, and and rightly or wrongly, we're kind of running with this this sort of approach. Is that when the markets are riding against you, um, no amount of news or promotion <clears throat> is going to turn you around. Right. And we, what we're trying to do is, you know, what is that break away from the average? What's going to do that? Because otherwise we're all going to ride the average and we all do to, to some degree. I mean, every bump, every every what have you. So for us to burn money when uh, the markets are riding down and against us, it uh, doesn't provide us with a whole lot of upside when we uh, but it does when the markets are starting to improve like we're seeing now. And that's when we would put more of our efforts into it. Um, as far as news flows, you know, so how do we bridge that gap? We did a lot of, uh, you know, we did a lot of work early in the year. Uh, we were drilling uh, at uh, at Red Willow, as you mentioned, we were drilling at Hook Lake, and we had a, a you know fair amount of news come out of that. Um, we had, quite frankly, intended to um, do some more drilling in the fall, but as we saw the markets falling off, it didn't make sense to us to start trying to raise money and put it in the ground you know, purely for news flow, because we knew that we had more to do. So what we did instead was spent, uh, you know, our time and efforts making sure that every single one of our projects was actually ready to take a drill. <clears throat> so, you know, we you talk about all of our projects, you know, we have been doing some geophysics, which may or may not be news to some investors. Um, we've been doing a lot of field surveying and a lot of, of, of prep work for, for, you know, permitting and for access and things like that. So that come January 1, Every single one of our projects is waiting for a drill to show up, and uh, and th and that will be our our uh, you know our focus because I think there's going to be there's there's a lot of money we we're getting I mean the inbound calls now are quite quite hefty, um, and there's going to be a, a ton of money spent in the basin in the next two years, so undoubtedly somebody is going to is going to find something else again. And, uh, you know, in our, in our case, it's just a matter of, of uh, making sure that the odds are with us as being the one. And, and that only comes with a drill. So, you know, we've been quiet. Now, we do stuff in the meantime. I mean, I mean it may seem kind of hokey, but I mean, every month for the last 15 years, we put out a press, we put out a, a, a newsletter. And that newsletter is, is about everything and everybody that's doing work in the basin. So we get a lot of, we got a lot of activity on it. We've got thousands of people that, that, that get that every month. And even if our news isn't in there, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, there's utility to the people that are receiving it, right? It's not just our promotion. It's here's how you keep up with the basin. And, and by the way, we're there, you know, cause a lot of this is about, um, is, is about awareness, right? I'm not going to be out there telling people they should invest in uranium because that's like boiling the ocean. Um, mm -hmm. 
right? Um, and there's enough people out there that believe that, that I don't have to beat that drum. What I want to make sure is, is if you are looking at uraniums and you do think that there's opportunities coming, that we're at least on the list because we think, you know, and it, because we think if you start evaluating the different companies and projects and things against each other, you know, we're, we're certainly not going to come out of the bottom. So, so that's really our effort. And, you know, to the point where we're doing, we're doing a weekly uh, podcast, same sort of thinking, you know, people don't stare at uranium every day, like, you know, you and I might. So for them to get something once a month, or for them to get something once a week, that is a more of it that keeps them up to date, that happens to have my name attached to it. Um, that's not a bad thing. And, it, and it, it keeps it keeps the awareness up there. And when things really do start to percolate, like they're starting to now, uh, you know, we hope we can take advantage of that. You you were hinting at, at M&A here and there at the beginning. And, and I, I personally like seeing m and because mm -hmm. I think there's just too many, uh, there's too much money in Canada being spent on g and &E for the number of, of projects that we have and relative to the advancement of those projects. Meaning I think there's too much corporate money being spent and not, um, it's not that yeah. it's nothing, but it's it's not as much. Anyways, what I'm getting to is you have 13 projects yourself, $20 million market cap company. That's too much for you to go and drill each one of them. So something is going to have to start to move. What what will that look like? like? Would you vend out the projects? Will you is it is it option agreements? Is everything on the table? Mm -hmm. Are you fusing two companies? Is that possible? What what's, what will that look like? Theoretically? Well, there's and there's there's a lot of ways to look at this. I mean, M and A as a, if you're dealing on the macro sense is is one thing, right? We saw consolidated uranium and ISO energy throw themselves together last week. We've seen um, you know um, energy fuels pick up, or not energy fuels, but uh, uranium energy pick up uh, UEX. Um, so things like that. But those are those are you know developers producers. That sort of thing. That's a little different. When you put two explorers together who have purely got whose assets are purely are our land positions, um, it becomes difficult because to your point, it's uh it's 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 a lot of work all of a sudden. And and you've got to raise a whole lot more money. And the market may not see it as accretive. I mean, remember, when you've got a piece of property, you have to spend $15 per hectare per year to hold it. So people with massive land positions are actually sitting on a huge liability. So they either have to vend this stuff out or or work it themselves. <clears throat> the um, and and we've been we've been talking to numerous people over the last couple of years in terms of of earnings because remember we've we've worked our way through four or five hundred thousand hectares of property in the basin. Like we've we've you know kicked around all of this stuff at one point or another, and what we're working on now are the projects that we've culled it down to. This is what we like. Um, you know, we started, you know, I think we, we started staking Red Willow almost 20 years ago for crying out loud. Um, so we got, you know, we, we've got, we've got the position that we like, not, it's not just a geographic play. And, uh, um, and we've been, so we have been approached and we would, we would love to option off stuff. Like we would love to get partners on this because I'd certainly rather own half of a deposit than, than, you know, than a, than a hundred percent of a, of an empty field. And and right now, when we see all this money coming into the markets in general, if if there's another company that wants to deploy capital against our project, we are more than happy to to entertain that. The problem is, is that um, the the folks that we do see and talk to are are just want to make hay on on uranium. They're looking to slap a uranium bumper sticker on the back of their old gold gold vehicle or something, and and they're not serious. They're not serious about the amount of money they want to spend, about how long they want to look. I mean, we all know. This is not a, a cheap endeavor, and it doesn't happen overnight. Um, you know, F 3s great hit that they hit last year. I mean, they were they're us. I mean, they were sitting at the same share price. They were working all their properties quietly, gently over the years, and finally they hit. You know, so they're they're a you know a ten year old overnight success, um, and that's the way this stuff happens. So if somebody comes to us and wants to you know spend a couple million dollars to earn in on twenty percent of a particular project. And they don't have a team. Um, that, that doesn't interest us because what happens, and you look around, you'll see a lot of this where people have been vending out projects, and the company they vended out to isn't working them anymore. Isn't and and now they're stuck with a twenty percent partner that that uh, you know that, that that is more of a liability than is going to be helpful. You can't do anything more with that project, or, or at least find another pro, another partner for it. So 
So yes, we're definitely interested in 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 partnering on on any and all of our projects. Um, but it has to be serious money, serious time, and uh, and and a commitment to to do it. Otherwise, otherwise, we're fine. We can work. We will work all of these projects. Right? We will if we raise five or six million dollars. If the markets are attractive to us and things go well, we can be drilling Hook Lake. We can be drilling Red Willow. We can be drilling Tabernor. We can be drilling uh, drilling Carson. All of these projects can and will get drilled next year. All of them will get drilled next year. Yeah, but, but if if the money and the markets and our investors, you know, want us to go that route, I mean that's that's the point, right? What is that route? Like if you, if you get more specific, what is that in terms of share price or market cap? What's the point at which you say, okay, I can now raise $5 million and that's not going to hurt anybody. We can do it now. But at this market cap, it's at under $20 million. You, <clears> it's <throat> a big, big chunk of dilution. Well, here. I'm talking Canadian. I think you're talking US. So right now we're sitting at about $27 million Canadian for me to raise okay. 5 million Canadian. And remember, we're talking about flow through too, right? So in Canada, we've got a flow, the flow through system that, that gives us a premium on, on our private placements and all the money we need is to be put directly in the ground. We have adequate hard dollars in the bank to carry, you know, to keep the lights on and, and, you know, over my head for, for a couple of years. Um, so every dollar that we're raising is, is raised at a premium and it's raised, uh, and it goes in the ground because that's, that's the rule. Okay. But if you can. I'm, by the way, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm looking at so there's 417 million shares outstanding. It's four and a half. Yeah, depends cents. on what day. I'm looking at September 30th. So it's September 30th, we're at six and a half. I mean, the price is okay. Down, that's so why. Yeah, we're, we're at, I think wild. we're at a nickel now. This but goes to show you this is a wild sector. But um, yeah. okay, um, you're saying you can do it right now. Why not do it right now? Do what? Do the financing? Yeah. What do you? Th what makes you think I'm not working on it? Okay, good point. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, I mean, and so you know, I mean, we've got uh, from a timing perspective, and a lot of this is driven by the mechanics of, in our case, this flow through mechanism I'm talking about. So um, we have to um, we have to raise that money by the end of this year, and it all has to be spent next year. I mean, there there are there's time limits on all of this stuff. So, you know, here we are. We came into September. We started prepping. We've been doing a lot of talking to all the funds here. There's specific flow through funds and 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 all the brokers and dealers that we work with on a regular basis. Um, as soon as Labor Day came and went, everybody got active again. And and of course, we're all we're all priming the pumps for this thing. So whether it happens in the next week or the next month or month and a half, um, you know, and now we're down we're down to the nitty gritty of the timing of it. Right mm -hmm. now, it's just the ballet of of you know do we do we see what the next week or two brings and we're we're up to ten cents or do we <laughs> or do we bother because well you know we know we're going to get a premium on it and but but what I can tell you is um, it it has to be done before the end of the year. That's well, that's just... interesting because again, as you mentioned, when you're raising flow through, you have two years to spend it, but it's kind of tricky because it's not twenty four months; it's mm -hmm. two calendar years. And if you raise it on December twenty fifth, one year elapses in a week. And well, there, so there's the real the real nuance to that is this: yes, you've got two years to spend it from the time. It's not calendar years; you've got two years to spend it. The point is, is that um, the way the system is set up is you get your tax break as I spend the money, not before, mm -hmm. right? So if you invest a hundred dollars in me today, you don't get that hundred dollar tax receipt until I actually spend that hundred dollars. The exception to that is I can I can renounce all of these expenditures to you at the end of the year, and that shortens my window to spend it. Right, right. So as long as um, you know, as long as I, where, whenever I, uh, if I, if I, uh, if I do the fi financing this this year, this calendar year, I run, I give you your full tax uh, receipt at the end of the year. I now have twelve months to spend that money. Now, if I do that in February of the year, then you're right. Then, I, then I've got almost two years to do that because I'm not renouncing till the end of the year because it's all tax driven. Okay. And if you raise 5 million, you still have time. To, I mean, you still have time to spend it properly. I guess spending money is not the hard part, but spending it. Uh, well, and it is the hard part. You know, you're not wrong there. And we've seen more companies than you can imagine run into that, that problem. You can't, if you raise too much, you're in trouble because you have to spend it. If you don't spend it, the it it's punitive. I mean, like it's a company killer, 
If I don't get it spent in time, um, I have to somehow go back to all of those sh- people that bought my shares a year or so ago, and and they have to pay back all of their tax deductions. Um, like it becomes pretty bad. So um, and and you know we've seen situations where people are just just working and working and working to get the money spent as opposed to actually you know using it properly. So you know I can tell you if we if we raise five million dollars. That's, you know, that it, we will get that spent and we'll get it spent, you know, effectively on across all of our projects that, that are ready to take a drill in the, in the priority that they're ready to take it. Hmm. Isn't, um, aren't your joint venture, joint venture partners at uh, Smart League supposed to come up with a, with some sort of a, a financing uh, request or package or something along those lines as well? Well, how, how, the, how our joint ventures work, and both of them work the same way. We usually have the meetings on the same day. So uh, it's because Cameco and Arano, um, they, they have their budget process once a year, and it starts around now. So over the next week or two, they are internally sorting out their kind of macro budgets, how much is going you know, to what corner of the mat. Um, we will meet with them in November. And uh, because we're the operator, it's the onus is on us to propose programs for the coming year. <laughs> and then we decide at that. And, and they give us a heads up as to what they're thinking in terms of cash and money once they get through their internal process. And uh, so we'll go in with our proposals. And, and at those meetings, um, the budget for the following year will be, pr- will be approved. Um, the work, because of where we are, is, is, is winter work because it's the cheapest time to get out there. And in that case, it's, it's conducive to that. So we're usually done spending our budget, you know, by the end of the winter. And, and that's typically it for the year on those two projects. Uh, so we will, you know, we'll, we'll get those, those put together and, and, and done, but those will be the first projects we will be, you know, drilling come the new year. Okay. And then we'll know more about that. So there's a bunch of stuff happening over, over Q4, basically with you. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's not, I'm not putting a drill on the ground. I mean, what you'll see news wise over the next couple of months is you'll see, you know, you'll see our, our, our proposals for those projects. You'll see that they're approved. Uh, we are doing uh, some final geophysics on our Tavernor projects so that they're ready to go. We've done, uh, we've been doing all our, all our ground reconnaissance work on our other projects at Carson and North and Red Willow, because those are going to be helicopter jobs um, and at Tavernor. Um, so we've got, yeah, a lot of, a lot of stuff that, uh, that we'll be talking about, right? I mean, again, you know, what's, what's going to move the needle, you know, uh, typically when I say I'm going to put a drill in the ground, it moves the needle. And when I tell you, you know, when I give you the results, it usually moves the needle in the wrong direction. So, uh, um, well, depending on what you drill, that's, right? that's for everybody. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you've drilled, how good you've drilled, unless, unless you hit a real, real zinger. Um, and that's, you know, so that's, you know, we go back to the re-rating. If, if we're all riding that same sort of curve, you know, what, what pulls you away from the average, right? Well, are you going for a real zinger at, at Hook Lake? Cause you've operated what, 15, 20 years. Absolutely. You have that now. Well, um, you know, we're looking at different areas and I mean, it, it, I could show you on a map, but you know, it's funny. We've been working up this Patterson corridor, right? Yeah. And you mentioned that at the onset, uh, it's, it's where arrow sits. It's where, um, 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 uh, fissions project sets and, and we've continued to hit mineralization, but there's, there's a couple of factors here that, that, uh, one is, as I've mentioned, you know, we, we, we probably move at a slower pace of exploration because of our partners. Um, number two, you mentioned Spitfire that we found, you know, Spitfire, we didn't drill that off because it's maybe, you know, it's somewhere between, you know, 12 and 18, 15 and 20 million pounds. And Cameco and Arano cannot free up budget for a project that, that doesn't have the potential to at least have 100 to 150 million pounds. That's just the, the snack bracket they work in. So, you know, we, we did enough work at Spitfire to know that we weren't going to add a zero to that number and we moved on. We're now uh, the last year or so where the Patterson corridor, you know, we've, been, we've, we've really understood what's going on up here and we've, we've hit, you know, mineralization a number of times. What we focused on in the last year was <clears throat> in our last drill program was what's called the Carter Corridor, and it's just to the west. And it's it's a similar uh, layout. We actually drilled there over a dozen years ago. Um, and again, we, we hit mineralization at the unconformity. And this is before anybody discovered anything out there. Things lit up over at Patterson for fission. So Cameco and Arano said, let's get our hike our butts over there. And that's where we've been ever since. Now that, um, but now that we understand the area so much better, we we see that actually Carter is sitting right in the right rock type 
that all these other uh, deposits have been identified in. And it's close to what we now know to be the heat source of where what would have been mobilizing the uranium. Mm-hmm. And and that's sort of validated in a couple of ways. One is one is F threes did a great has you know they're drilling into a great area um, starting last year, and it's on the other side of that area that was the heat source. So things were moving out. We um, we drilled there last winter, uh, this past winter. Um, we were doing fairly big step outs, like eight hundred meter step outs, because we're really just trying to understand the area. It's a long area, um, and you can get a handful of deposits in between those drill holes and it's just what we were how we were sussing out the area and it was wasn't until the last hole as we were heading north that we started to come into mineralization and boron and 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 all the other goodies that that we're used to seeing along patterson so that's where the program ended um you know were it just us we probably would have kept a drill going but we were at the end of that program the end of that budget and uh and uh, Camico and Arano want you know want to spend some time digesting all that information that we just pulled up so um that's what we're going back with in a month or so um we'll be and uh, in January we will carry on and follow up from that point and and keep heading north so those partnerships are obviously interesting to me for 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 the money side of things when it comes down to the juniors, but there's also risks to it. Um, uh, the way I look at it is, and it, it sort of like they might be taking mm-hmm. out too early or something along those lines and, or not. How does that work? Like how do you manage the risk of, of sort of it, losing it, it your 21%? Well, we don't, we have no, we have no risk of losing it. <clears throat> Right, it's ours. We haven't earned in or anything. No, but we, I mean, we, get, get, you know, get, getting it sold at too low of a valuation or something along those lines. Well, you see, that happens. That happens when you've got a rofer, right? When your partners have got a rofer, because mm-hmm. then you can't get a serious market offer for it, and and we don't, which gives them heartburn. Um, but but that's that's one of the aspects. I mean, we we can we could sell this at any time. Um, um, you know, we don't, we don't have to take an offer from them having said that. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, and you're, you're pointing out a, a number of the the challenges we face and you're right. I mean, as I said, they've got a long-term outlook. We've got a short-term lo- outlook even, even more so there when they look at their exploration budgets internally um, their focus isn't on opening up a whole new area. Their focus is on how do I keep feed on the Eastern side of the basin flowing into my mills? Right. And so, so, you know, they're, and rightly so from their perspective, you know, their, their focus is on, you know, that's where they want to spend their money. How do I find more stuff over there? Um, But, but it doesn't stop them from, you know, carrying on what they're carrying on, on on the West. But, you know, that's, that's sort of a, a, a a struggle or a pressure point, if you will. Um, And, and, you know, they do, they do march at a different, at a different pace. So, um, you know, they want to spend X amount of dollars. And they don't want to spend another X amount of dollars until we've completely digested the data that we've extracted from the ground the first time around. And, um, you know, too many juniors are out there prospecting with a drill. So they're spending two or three times as much money to find the same thing. And, uh, yeah, they're creating news, but, uh, you know, it may get them to a different place. So mm. it's, uh, yeah, there's 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 pros and cons. Absolutely. And, it, you know, we've had, and, it, and it's part of it's part of the negotiation when you set this thing up. We had years ago we had a um we had an arrangement with Rio Tinto, who was earning in on on and our our problem was what what a major can do if you don't if you don't set yourself up properly is they can say, okay, I'm gonna earn in over the next six years and I'm gonna put ten million dollars into this project. Well, they can put it on a shelf for five. They can take your best project and park it. Now what? Now you got no news. You got no nothing. And and you've seen that happen time and time again mm. um, with them. And with, you know, not just Rio Tinto, but any major, because again, they've got other internal um, uh, objectives and focuses and priorities that are very different from from us, because we're in a different industry. We're an explorer. They're a producer. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's there's there's a lot of challenges making sure you get the balance right if you're going to work with these folks. Mm. Um, you know, the other thing is their costs. And, I, and you know, I know we had the challenge with Rio as well, is <clears throat> a program that might cost us a million dollars, they'll spend $5 million doing the same thing because they are because they are bringing in a completely different camp and they have to have eight doctors on site and they have to have trails that are so wide and, and, and. Like they just bring in their template 
for what has to happen. And it's, 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 uh, I've seen a few people in the basin get shocked by, you know, they're participating in, uh, in a, in a joint venture with a major and uh, the costs just all of a sudden are, are, are astronomical. Well, but if you, okay, if, if a program that they would, that, that would cost the majors 10 million, you could do it for a million. Well, but in this case, if they go for a program of 10 million, you would have to contribute 21%, it's 2.1 million. But then the program is really only worth 1 million in total, you see. After my, after my management fee. Yeah. So how does that yeah. mean you, you have to keep putting up money? I mean, depending on, like, if, if they want to come out with a, a program of... Well, again, remember, remember, we, we, we are a third vote. We may only own 21%. But it's a three-way vote. So if okay. if if Cameco and Arano have to agree as well, and we've had we've had years like that. I mean, we we you know when we were uh, working into Spitfire, they threw they wanted to throw five million dollars in that, and I tell you, it was tough to spend it in that winter. Um, but but it was it was primarily driven by Arano. They wanted they wanted to increase the budget. Cameco reluctantly went along because they don't want to tick off their partner. Um, but at the end of the day, it it meant that we had to raise you know, half a million dollars. So, um, you know, it's, it's not hard to keep up with them given what we're doing. And in fact, if, if Cameco had decided that they didn't want to do it and Arana was, was, uh, you know, was, was definitely wanted to, the final vote would have been ours. You know, so, so there is that kind of playoff. It's not a, it's not a one-on-one. -on -one, we have a majority partner here because we don't have a majority partner. And that, mm -hmm. that helps a bit, but never have we run into a situation where everybody wasn't in total agreement. Um, you know, the last thing we're going to do is try and rile up one of our partners. Uh, yeah, of course. Well, we're, you're, so it's you're not, not and it's also cheaper easier. for them. I was going to also going to mention that you know, as 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 easy it is for me to keep up with. One of the things that keeps them investing in this project is it's it's reasonably low cost for them, right? So for every million dollars that we spend, they only have to come up with four hundred thousand dollars. Right. right. So a three million dollar project, you know, it, like it's not a big nut to cover, um, you know, to keep to keep that project alive and moving forward properly. Right. And then in the end, you're not enemies, you're partners. So no. you're working towards, a, you know, no. the same goal, which and but I assume an, a, an exit <clears throat> for you eventually on, on those two projects is is first thing that comes to mind is that, you know, they just take it over. Is that something that's in your contracts? Well, like no, they have not. a first right. It's not. It's not. Okay. So, so what happened if we, if and when we find something, maybe in a few months, um, you know, there. I mean, we're an exploration company, right? Exploration companies, by and large, don't become mining companies because yeah. that's a different business. So, our business is to find something, define it, you know, and then monetize it in in whatever way possible. So, if and when this thing becomes a monster, we will have the choice of either going along for the ride and letting them build a mine as a partnership, as a group, or we don't, we don't have to exit at all if we want to, you know, take that ride. Um, but we do know that we've got, you know, if they do want to go that route and take this something into production that, that, you know, one or both of them would probably easily buy us out. And if we didn't like the price we got there, we'll, we'll find somebody else. Okay. Okay. But moving on to the, the, to doing more work on other projects though, that would mean that, well, you're probably going to have to grow your team, right? Because that's you know your team also sort of ebbs and flows. Or how how do you plan on doing that? No, we've um, we've kept a pretty solid team together. Like all the work we're talking about, we can do quite handily with with the folks we've got. I mean, we've got we've we've got you know you know half a dozen folks, and the way we've been able to keep them again, we're trying to we're trying to ride this thing as as smoothly as possible. Um, you know, when things are slow. We have we have arrangements and relationships with with other other companies that we can we can lend them out we can rent them out right to make sure that we don't lose the them people that's the problem pardon the people? people the people for sure that's because wild. the problem we have is you know you may spend a year or two training up people in the basin who know what you do and how you do it and know that region and then times get tough and you have to let them all go and that's that's ridiculous like that and that's happened once or twice in our history here so we've we've put together an arrangement whereby um, you know, when these people are in the field, they get paid a lot of money when they're not, they get paid less, but there, there is a, you know, there's a minimum to that. And, and we find them work when things, when we don't have field work for them to do, you know, we'll find them work somewhere else and we'll make sure that they're getting paid and, and it's interesting stuff and different commodities and, and what have you. So keeping the team together has, 
has been a focus. I mean, we, we've put, you know, a lot of time and thought into how we manage our people so that we keep them all together. And, and we also, um, you know, we will bring in rental help, if you will. So, you know, we, we, we do have arrangements with, um, with agencies that provide us with, um, you know, additional uh, geologist support where we need it. And, uh, but we always have our own people to oversee and manage all of that stuff. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all about setting yourself up so that you can dial, dial the dial up or down, um, as painlessly and seamlessly as possible. Hmm. And, and that whole conversation that we're having here, uh, you know, I sort of started it with hook league, but I, I assume most, if not all of it applies to smart league as well, right? Which is the other joint venture. Well, for sure. And, and, you know, just to be upfront, smart league will probably be uh, just geophysics right now. Um, again, we haven't been back there in a while. There's a whole area in the north that um, that that uh, we all want to focus on, and and it does require some additional geophysics before we drill. So that'll that would be the the winter program up up at Smart Lake. But you know, in putting things in order, the you know our targets. We've got a dozen target regions on Red Willow. And, and we've, we've adequately tested three of them, which we talk about a lot. And through that, we've identified the fact that there is disseminated uranium throughout the area and, you know, and all the other things we like, we just haven't popped a hole through a, through a deposit yet. And uh, those other nine areas are, are going to continue to be our focus as we go forward. Um, but, but they're in different areas that are probably require a helicopter, as does Carson, as does Turner Lake. Right. So you can't do you don't want to be doing helicopter work in the winter because your days are so short. So your helicopter is in the air for you can't get two shifts in. Right. In the summer, you can get two shifts in because you're helicoptering people in and out. Um, so, you know, the, the lineup of work would be, um, you know, Smart Lake and, and Hook Lake, uh, you know, in Q1, um, probably around May or June, we would get up to uh, Red Willow and Carson because they're close together if we're tar tarting a helicopter around. Um, then we would be able to get over to Turner Lake uh, later in the summer. And, you know, again, it depends on how the markets are reacting to all of this and, and whether there's, um, you know, money available or whether the markets want us to be spending money at that volume. You know, we can we could get down and start drilling at Tabernor and and Russell South. So, you know, we've 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 got the lineup. So, again, it goes back to being able to kind of dial up and dial down and not just run into a wall at some point in time along the way. That's kind of how we've managed ourselves for the last 15 years. But focus, hook leak, then smart leak, then red willow, that's sort of your top three. And then it starts going off if and when right. you have money, you know, further yeah. down to and, and I mean it's it's as it's as it's it's ordered as much by um just just seasonality than, than anything else. We can't we can't drill red willow in the winter. We could. We can get another drill. We've we've got the teams to do two at the same time, <clears throat> but we don't need to, and it wouldn't be a, a, you know effective for us to do it that way. So you know we've got things spaced out in a way that that we can just keep keep going from project to project as as the seasonality dictates to get up there. Wouldn't it Wouldn't it be better if and and we're talking a forward looking statement, speculation, or whatever in the realm of of imaginary of, of my imagination here but wouldn't it be better if you if, the, if this is your sort of your top three to look for optionees on all the other 10 projects where you can have income from the other mm -hmm. projects and we finance are. drilling on the top three we definitely are we are and we're talking to people mm -hmm. absolutely the, the, like i said the challenge is you have to make sure that they're in it for the long game that's all absolutely if, if we had a serious partner come in and say look we want to you know we want to honestly earn in on Pick a pick a you know pick a Russell South right. Well, that's fine. Um, you know this is going to be the first time drilling. Um, you know you have to spend. You know this is going to cost you X, and we don't want you just earn in twenty percent and leave. Right? You got to spend enough to earn in a majority part ownership of it. Well, what is that? So, more specific. I'm sorry for interrupting here, but how's that? Like, I, if, like I want to start a uranium company exploration sure. company tomorrow, <laughs> and I want something smaller. So let's say I want Carson Lake. That's what five thousand hectares, right? It's sure. drill ready, I believe. So there's no <clears throat> physics or anything yeah. else that I yeah. have to do. What, what do we? What's the deal? What do you want from me? What do I want from you? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if you take Carson, then the what you have to look at is what would it? How much money would you have to spend to absolutely, positively know that there's nothing there? How much to kill it? <laughs> Essentially, right? And that you know, and that's that's your that's your macro number because you know, as I pointed out many times, when you look at the discoveries over the last ten years. 
those companies spent eight to $10 million on that particular project before they even hit a discovery hole. Now, in the case of Carson, it's not as big as, say, a Red Willow. So, yeah. so I don't know. I mean, it, it might be something to the effect of, you know, whatever that number is. Um, was that 5,000 meters at, let's yeah. say. I mean, make up a number. Say, say, okay, I, I need five you million. To, I need to spend $3 million, $5 million okay. over the next two years. And, and with that, you'll earn 51%. Hmm. Now, if you don't, if you spend only 2 million, then you get nothing. Hmm. See, a lot of people want to come in. Well, no, I want to earn 10 and then I want to turn 30. Like I want to, I want to keep, I want to earn every time I spend money. And I'm saying, well, no, because I don't need a 10% partner. And now I can't do anything more with that project. How am I going to find another partner? Because now yeah. you've, you've tied. So that doesn't interest me because I can find that money. You know, the two, three million dollars to, to burn Carson <clears throat> is 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 not, you know, is not out of my realm of being able to do it myself. So I need to know that you're serious, that you've got the people to do it, <clears throat> that know what they're doing, um, that you've got, you know, it looks like you've set yourself up in a financially stable way, and that this is a project that's going to get that kind of priority, and that you're not just using it as a qualifying transaction to take a shell public, right? And then and then bring in some other project instead. So right. you know that that's that's my that's the concern. So typically these these things will be, you know, here's X amount of dollars that have to be spent over three years, say. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you what is that? Yeah. So I get it, and and that would if I find something, or even if I don't find something, that still increases the value of the project for you. But it's not immediate liquidity. Like you're not the five mil, the, the three to five million that I would have to spend. Mm -hmm. You're not getting that money. That money's going in the ground. Going in the ground. So, it's going in the ground. So if 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 and when they find the the massive deposit that sits there, we all we all rise with that one. But if we don't find anything, uh, now you know that a project is a zero, <clears throat> and you also yeah. didn't earn any liquidity. Well, no, but would we have earned it if we'd spent the money and found nothing? I mean, yeah. typically these things also come with with upfront payments and 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 other things along the way, mm -hmm. right? So, um, um, and you're not looking for a cat. You, what you're you're looking for a deposit for crying out loud, right? If there's nothing there, there's nothing there. You know, I remember early early days. One of our board members looked at looked at uh, looked at us and and said, "Okay, so if we spend five million dollars drilling this thing this summer, what are the odds that we're going to find a deposit?" And the response was, well, if it's not there, zero. <laughs> so, you know, you don't know until you get there. <clears throat> and that's why you've got to, you know, you've got to maximize the odds of finding it. And that's, you know, that's not about one big Hail Mary. I believe it's here. Let's drill there. It's it's about really understanding what you're doing and tracking it and chasing it, you know, responsibly and intelligently. It's mm -hmm. not one big flat sheet of uranium out there in Saskatchewan. So what, what it's true, but what I was wondering is exactly, isn't there an option where you can have these projects earning, you know, hard cash in the meanwhile, like, you know, paying us hard cash? Yeah. Well, no, because, well, yes and no. Yes and no. No, because if, you know, when, when it comes down to it, when you're doing any of these agreements, the point is we want to, it's all about putting money in the ground. Right. This isn't a, if you want to buy my project, why would I sell you? If I was just going to sell you my project for $2 million, why did I have it to begin with? If it has the potential to hold a hundred million you know, pounds of uranium. Right. So for me, just to sell off, none of us want to sell off projects that we like, that we've got. <clears throat> you want to keep an ownership in it. Um, and, and if you're really, truly looking for a deposit, you know, you want that money going in the ground. The other side of it, though, and we've made this offer to some, you know, we've gotten some serious people coming out of, say, Australia or the United States who don't necessarily know the basin. And, and we've, you know, we've offered up the fact that we'll operate for you, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. If you want to, if you want to earn in and do this, you know, we can, we can, we've got the time and the, and the people and we know the place, we know the space, we know the service providers, we know the permitting and all, um, you know, we'll do that. You know, we can do that. And and so in that way, we're actually being compensated. That's how we somewhat earn. We can earn money out of this stuff as well mm -hmm. uh, by through that through that factor. But no, it's if if um, <clears throat> it's it's all about maximizing the amount of money that goes in the ground.
I mean, that was your opening statement. There's too many people sitting around paying for overhead. Yeah, it's true. So why do I want that money being raised to, to put in my pocket? So instead of in the ground. Well, because so you do want ownership, but do you want ownership of 13 projects? Because you want it going in the ground. But, you know, if I give you cash, you have the ability to put that money in the ground on one of your top three focuses, because that's sort of where we started talking. Right. Instead of having it. Maybe maybe sort of I'm or maybe I'm vending out one of my top three. Like, I don't know. Maybe somebody's not if they're really serious. Maybe if they're really serious, they don't want my smallest project. They want my my maybe my third, fourth choice. Hmm. Right. I mean, okay. you know, it's another aspect as well. The The name of the game is to find something. That's all. It's not, I'm not in the business of, of there's no revenue in this game. Right. Until there's a trend, until you find something and there's a transaction, there's no revenue. So, um, <clears throat> you know, so, you know, when, when, you know, people are setting up these project generators, I thought we were all project generators, but that's another thing. Um, you know, what, what are you know? What are they in the business of? At the end of they're not they're not as much they're 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 in the business of finding something because they've got some projects they hold themselves, but then they've got these other projects that they're trying to make money on. And a lot of those deals you see there's annual payments and shares being what what have you. And you know I think people looking at these companies have to look at who they've vended these out to and and what's going on with those projects. And because if 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 we're not in the business of finding a deposit then investors are just riding the price of uranium. And that's not, uh, <laughs> a lot of people want to do exactly that, uh, but that, that might be a discussion in and of itself. But so there is- that's, And yeah, that's, that's fine that's, too. Yeah. I'm not saying that's not fine. But if you're if you're dealing with an exploration company, I mean, uh, let's face it, we're, we're a highly speculative investment. And the and the the upside isn't riding the price of uranium. You can do that by investing in Sprott or, or what have you. It's, it's, it's when we actually hit a real a real discovery. F3 hit a real discovery, you know, at the end of last year, and they went up 300%. That's what you're looking for. So who's maximizing the odds of, of drilling that next hole? I think with them, though, is that they, they own their own, it's 100% owned project, right? So that for you, that would have to be on um, on uh, Red Willow or one of the other projects that, that yeah. you would hit it. So. There, and, and there is revenue for some of these companies, as you said. So there's the project generators, um, some of them close to you. Uh, some of them have, have quite a lot of projects yeah. that that, yeah, yeah. that generate. And it's a different game. Um, so that that's sort of where I was going with this is like, can you not turn your portfolio into that? And then you've answered that already. So I, I get it. Like You don't want to. You're in the game of making discovery. And you just want, you know. Um, well, we will do it. We will do it. But not so I can earn an extra half a million dollars to put in the ground over here. Because mm -hmm. the cost of that capital is too rich. If I if if I really believe that I've got prospective property, I want to work. I want somebody to find something on it. Mm. I don't just want to use that to, you know, pay my overheads for the next year or two. Right. Right. Maybe, maybe, and then have it disappear. Hmm. Okay. Your um, biggest project, though, the um, Tabernor, is that how you pronounce it? Tabernor. It's called Tabernor. Yeah. That one. Well, th that's not, because mm -hmm. you, you said they're all drill ready, but I believe you still have some geophysics to do there before you can drill it, or can you go and drill it tomorrow? We, we could go in and drill tomorrow, but we, we want to finish. So what, what those are, just, just to clarify, is it's, it's a, Tabernor is a, is a fault structure that starts in South Dakota. <laughs> And it runs right up through through the continent and and up through the uh, eastern side of the basin. Now, if you you know if you've seen the mine trend and you're looking at at the maps of Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. you know that that there's this southwest to northeast sort of fabric, right? That everything lies along. Uh, the Tabernor structure then cut up through it, and so when you're looking at a lot of the material with regards to the some of those mines. Um, they've identified that as being uh, one of the control factors of, of deposition. So what we did um, a while ago was we staked, that's why they look like they are, they're towers, because they're, they, they cover the fault system and they are directly underneath all of the major deposits to the north. Viola. So um, that, was, that was the original approach. We then went in and did some uh, uh, geophysics over the entire area. We've identified uh, the conductor that runs right across all three of them. We went back and we staked up the rest of that conductor. So there's, you know, the target zone there is is 50 kilometers long. 
And we're going to do some more definition geophysics over it, but um, but it's ready to, and that's happening in a month or so. So I mean that'll that's ready to drill next year. And and uh, you know, Can Alaska, God bless them, just uh, you know announced a good hole a week or so ago, and it is <clears throat> it's just off our claim line to the west on that conductive belt. Oh, it's a gay key project, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So, you know, things are lighting up over there. And so that's a, that's a, you know, it's an earlier stage project because we haven't drilled it yet. It hasn't been drilled for years and years. But uh, so, you know, we'll be doing first, uh, first pass drilling. Mm. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's got a story. You know, it's, it could well be a, a great story. But until you go out there and do some drilling on it, you don't it's, know. It, it's on the outskirts of the basin, though. Um, yeah. So what it was, so it's basement hosted. I mean, well, they, it's, a, it's nothing out yet, is, but you, you everything is out there would be. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that's the big change. There's been a couple of big changes in the last 10, 15 years. You know, one certainly is that everybody loves nuclear right now. And and 15 years ago, everybody hated nuclear. Um, but uh, the other thing is, is the basin, is that things can be found outside of the basin. You know, f Fission's triple R is way outside the basin. Um, um, you know, Arrow is you know, half of it is outside of the basin. Mm -hmm. So it's because the basin was bigger back, back when, when big lizards roamed the earth, it was, it was bigger. It just got scraped off by the glaciers. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we're drilling into was originally under sandstone cover. Now I, I believe, we believe you can only go out so far. Like a lot of people are going way outside the basin. Um, but, but, you know, we're we're trying to stay within that that realm of reasonability as to where we think, uh, um, you know, w how far outside the basin you can go. But there's and definitely, absolutely. definitely that's, activity out there. Well, that's the, the type of deposits that built the basin to begin with, right? So you have people calling it Athabasca 2.0, but it's kind of Athabasca 0.0 because that's sort of the um th those type of deposits built the basin in the first place that made it the it Athabasca did. basin, and then we went over to look for deeper, higher grade stuff. Um, because we found a couple of them in an arrow, you know, made a big splash and now everybody's looking yeah. for an arrow. I um, mean, Key Lake, Key Lake was the first one that identified the whole conformity notion that it was yeah. sitting at the end of the conformity. And, but it was right at the edge of the basin. You know, remember we're talking about a bowl that gets pretty deep in the middle. So you can only go so deep before it becomes, you know, a bit of a Hail Mary to try and hit anything down there. But, um, but yeah, around um, your early, your early deposits were all found around the edge of the basin and even slightly out. Right, right. Okay. Are you thinking of um, participating in any in any capital raises? Is that something standard that you do with the company, or how do you look at that part? Well, well, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, we'll we'll be we'll be looking to raise. You know, now that things are heating up, we're getting a lot of uh, ac action from the the flow through funds again. We'll be we'll be looking to raise money over the next month or two in uh, uh, to to do all that good work we talked about next year. Hmm. But that's not. I mean, that's flow through alone, no hard hard cash well there's hard i mean to, to the extent that there's hard dollars available um you know we'll certainly be i mean it's the hardest part of the, the equation to raise mm -hmm. so we we have you know we, we've ra been able to raise adequate uh hard dollars in the past to carry us for years um you know we're, we're quite all right right now but again flow through doesn't work for for uh investors outside of canada right so to the extent that we have us or european investors who want to participate and that happens, we can only offer them hard dollars because they can't, there's no tax advantage to them to buy flow through. Yeah. So yeah, right. there, there, there may be, there may be, and probably will be a hard dollar component to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know, the number I'm giving you is really the, the responsible number that we can, you know, know that we're going to be able to properly spend in the coming, uh, in the coming year. Right. Well, maybe there's investors that just want to give you a premium of the goodness of their heart. Who knows? Oh, yeah. um, all the time, you... all the time. <laughs> Do you, but what about you personally? Because because it's you know, another thing that that you would notice is or another thing that I look at is how aligned is management with me? You know, um, insider ownership and stuff like that. Yep. Are you planning on increasing your insider ownership? Well, again, and I think we talked about this last time. We've you know we've we've been at this for a while, right? We've been holding on to shares for fifteen years, and we have been buying up and down over the years. Well, no, actually, we haven't been buying down. We've we've you know we've we've uh, we are currently insiders hold about seven percent, um, and uh, you know, and we have acquired shares along the way um, over fifteen years. You don't do that every week, every day. Um, I think at this point, we are you know we're 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 everybody's pretty aligned in terms of uh 
their ownership position and, and we're all focused on on uh, creating value share value um moving forward so that's why we continue to look at different opportunities different transactions different you know ways of, of uh you know maximizing our, our pricing on our on our raises etc because we hold a lot of these shares as well and mm -hmm. we'll continue to do so you you won't find us having sold any <laughs> well it's that, that's always a it's a difficult topic um, because you basically have retail who wants you to be buying every day and put all, like, everything that you have to just put it open market purchases, right? And that's not feasible, and it doesn't necessarily um, it doesn't necessarily make or break a company. Uh, but it is, of course, nice to see open market purchases. It's nice to see insiders but participating in capital raises, and mm -hmm. so it gives you an, an extra, you know, layer of um, of confidence as a retail investor. So there's two, there's two I think you have to be here. mindful, and I know you are, the fact that that we are in a, you know, investors are investing in companies that are non-revenue generating at mm -hmm. all, right? This is this is this is uh, only what comes in, and uh, um, you know, so and and these are companies that still have to be run properly, right? Yep. I, I don't think you'd want me taking nothing out or living, you know, not able to earn a living or or not pay our people. Or, 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 or. So, you know, it, and it, it is, I understand that. I mean, if, if investors had their way, you know, all this money would go on the ground and nobody get paid for anything and that'd be fine. I mean, that's, that's the way to maximize the money in the ground. But, you know, uh, you know, you've got public companies here that are, that, you know, have, have to be run and managed and steered and, and things have to be done on a regular basis. And, uh, so, you know, despite the fact that we have expenses like any normal company, you know what we don't have is is a top line and uh and so you know too many investors i think find that that um you know they think that they think that the the expenses should be aligned with the revenue <laughs> no it's true <laughs> and they can't be they just can't be so it's 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 not a difficult topic and i i think it's you know exploration is a, is a hard business for investors to understand because it's there's i mean we've talked about a lot of the nuances here that that people don't necessarily get um, you know, you can't poke a hole in something today and start digging it out of the ground tomorrow. Um, exploration companies don't become mining companies. They monetize it along the way. Um, you know, they, they, you know, they have to ride these ups and downs. So it's, it's, they're not normal businesses. If you're an investor that invests in, in a lot of different industries and a lot of different things, um, you know, there's, there's nuances to this industry that, that are, that are real head scratchers. And uh, and it's hard sometimes to to explain the full the full layout, and that that gets that gets us and other people into trouble because we try and reduce what we do down to a soundbite and something simple and and down to a picture that you know that that people can understand, but it may help them understand, but it but in many cases it 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 distorts the reality. Mm. I'll tell you about that. We've been talking for about an hour, so um, you know, for the people list still listening, that's. Not that type of people. It's a listening. different type of it's a different type of person that watches these and you know the shorter five, ten, twenty minute sure. interviews. So it's um no, you're right. Is it is this the is this the only thing you're doing right now? Are you are you active in it in anything else? Because I, I know you you used from to from what standpoint? Um, you mean um, oh for a living? <laughs> no, just yeah, just professional standpoint, uh, career standpoint. For sure. You know, we do, yeah, absolutely. Well, not now. I mean, things have gotten very busy now. I mean, this, you know, what we're into now. And, and a lot of the things we're looking at requires, you know, some full-time attention all over the place. Mm. It doesn't always. So, you know, there are, we do look at, at other things and, uh, um, you know, to, to, to keep us rolling. And uh, yeah, we're looking at, I'm looking at a lot of rare earth, a lot of critical mineral projects. Um, and uh, that seems to be a real, a real heyday right now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, in the longer term, like bigger, bigger situations, because we're seeing the world really focusing on that and trying to um, water down the control that say China has over a lot of these, a lot of these critical minerals. Um, you know, so we're seeing countries like uh, Kazakhstan, we're seeing countries like, like the Saudi Arabia throwing billions of dollars at, at reducing their reliance on oil revenue. Um, you know, things like that. So it's a lot of interesting opportunities coming out of this shift in the critical mineral space to, uh, to kind of manage their domestic control over some of this stuff. Right, they're not involved with any other public companies uh, as uh, an not executive currently. part, so, or was that? Not currently. No, not mm -hmm. currently. I mean, I've sat on boards, come and go, you know, in and out. Um, mm -hmm. But no, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Uh, 
engage with any other public company. All right. How's Scott doing? Just fabulous. <laughs> he's, he's well, you know, I think I think the happiest he is is the fact that we've now got a team that that is is up and trained and can be sent out, and he doesn't have to ride a drill half as much as he used to. Hmm. Um, but no, he's he's been kept busy, um, and you know, and again, when things are slow, um, you know, he's able to look and help other projects on a consulting basis, and that's helpful. But for right now, you know, again, we're all focused on on what's coming up in the new year, um, right. on getting everything. Um, everything done and everything prepared and, and understanding it properly. So we're not just, as I say, you know, prospecting with a drill. Um, so he's busy, 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 busy right now. Why don't you let him in front of the camera? He's just as good looking as you. So he's an embarrassment to the family. So we don't, uh, you know, he, you know what, this, this is, this is what works. He, 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 he likes to do what he's doing and he's exceptional at it. And he likes me to do what I'm doing because he doesn't have any interest in doing that. But mm. More than happy to put him on a camera. If somebody actually wants to talk uh, geology with him and get deep into it. Um, he's uh, he's he's always up for that and always capable of that. Uh, that but as far is... as you know, talking uh, investors and things like that who are trying to understand the picture from a from an investment standpoint, um, that just gives him the willies. <laughs> no, so he, he he doesn't like cocktail parties at conferences either. I'm sure. Oh, he well, yeah, because they usually they there's usually more 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 geeks around as well that he can talk to. But no, no, he's. He is very sociable and 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 very much presentable. And uh, and again, if if uh, you know if we were to to do a a technical, we've had him do a few few for some of the mm. analysts, et cetera. I mean, when we're talking to the analysts um, at these places, that's that's usually when he's he's up at the front of the room uh, right. going through some of the detail of the projects. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's uh, I will take you up on that offer eventually when it comes down to learning more about the project te technically. I like I'm not a geologist, obviously, but I like uh, talking to geologists. You always learn a lot. So, uh, yeah. yeah, Chris, this has been fun. That's it. That's the okay. I don't have any questions. Anything else that I'm forgetting to ask here at the end? I can't imagine there is. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's it. That's the pod. That's Thank you so okay. much for being here. Thank you.